In the previous three episodes, we welcome guests from academia, state and federal agencies, and associations representing various industry, tech, telecommunication, and state DOT interest. We examine the effectiveness and maturity of B2X technology and its capacity to save lives. We also discussed our current self-made situation and the obstacles we are facing for V2X deployment. Today, we're going to delve deeper into the perspectives of vehicle manufacturers, specifically two manufacturers that either have a production level vehicle equipped with V2X technology or have announced plans for V2X deployment. We'll hear about those activities and examine how they are affected by recent regulatory actions. My first guest today is John Cap. John is the Director of Global Vehicle Safety, Technology, Strategy, and Regulations for General Motors. In this role, he is responsible for championing new safety technologies, product safety content, safety messaging, and safety regulatory strategies. During his 30-year career in safety, John's work has ranged from crashworthiness and occupant protection in crashes to the development of electronic collision avoidance systems. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering from Kettering University and a Master of Engineering from Purdue University. John, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad to be here. Great. Well, let's just jump right into this. Uh, I know GM is currently the only manufacturer in the U.S. that has equipped a production vehicle with V2X technology. Can you talk about why GM made that decision, what the system capabilities are, and what have you learned from this deployment? So uh, yeah, there's a lot of that in that question. Um, so we, we made a decision back in 2014 that uh, we were going to deploy uh, V2X in actual production vehicles in 2017, and we did. We, we put it in production using DSRTC technology for about three years of the uh, Cadillac CTS production as we made it standard equipment. Um, you know, at, at the time, you know, we had been working as an industry um, at, with, with other OEM partners, with NHTSA, others in the DOT, Federal Highway, what have you, uh, suppliers for, for over a decade already at that point. And uh, we, we felt that um, enough of the standards were in place through, uh, through SAE, IEEE, things like that, um, in terms of the communication protocol and um, uh, recently at that time, uh, there was just completed a large uh, 3,000 vehicle study that uh, the DOT had run in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with uh, aftermarket devices that were put in to kind of show and prove out the technology. So a lot, a lot was coming together. And also around that time, you know, NHTSA was pretty serious about moving forward with uh, uh, an FMVSS standard that would create a, a uniform requirement for um, V2V uh, boxes and new vehicles. And um, so we, we kind of decided to just anticipate all that that was happening and that we felt we had enough information and we believed in it enough to, uh, to want to go ahead and put in a production vehicle. And, uh, you know, part of it was we wanted to show some safety leadership uh, because, you know, NHTSA has shown that uh, in a study they did about 80% of all non-impaired crashes, you know, not non-impaired drivers, uh, and crashes could be addressed or helped at least by by equipping vehicles with with V2V or V2X technology, and you know, and the reasons are because you know it can do so much. You can see around corners, you can see ahead in traffic, um, uh, and and it, it probably was going to have the capability to do more than any other technology we've really ever encountered. Um, so the potential was big, but it was also a tough. Uh, it's been it's been tough to get everything in place because it's a coordinated, collaborative kind of technology. You need to be able to talk to other vehicles, and so our purpose for putting it in, you know, announcing in 2014 at the ITS conference in the fall of 2014, there was a there was a big conference in uh, the ITS America uh, conference uh, World Congress actually was in uh, Detroit that year, and uh, so it was a it was an opportunity. We had a big stage to to make that announcement that we're actually going to put it in production. Um, to show some leadership and to move things forward. And, and then selfishly, it also, you know, gave us a chance to, to learn. Um, as with any new technology we put into 
to vehicles. It takes some years to work the bugs out, to develop it, you know, get the engineering team trained, get the supply base relationships in place. Um, you know, it, it, it's always difficult. So, so we want to get ahead of that curve a little bit because we we kind of saw that there was going to be a large deployment happening. Turned out we were we were quite right on that, uh, but we saw that happening at the time, and we wanted to get ahead of it and, and get ourselves uh, lined up. So we put it into twenty some thousand Cadillac CTSs over that three year run, and uh, you know it had limited feature set. Um, early on, first application, it did uh, um, we call uh, emergency braking. Um, so, you know, a vehicle four or five or six vehicles ahead in traffic is applying its brakes, and it could send that signal back to to the vehicle that that I'm in, and 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 let me know that hey, you know, there's potential for a pile up here. It did a uh, emergency vehicle feature. I would pick up emergency vehicles or vehicles with their flashers on on the side of the road, and uh, and then the, the third feature was a uh, um, was a uh, slippery roads or road conditions. So you know you could use stability control feature to again send, send a signal back um, on the road to tell other other drivers that you know maybe there's some ice ahead or or something like that. So initially it was a fairly limited set of features, um, but again allowed us to to learn and you know dip our toe in the water. And, and then you know lastly on that the you know our our hope our intention was that we were going to kind of draw others into the water with us that saw a lot of the same uh, stars lining up. And uh, you know, I, I think that could have happened, but, you know, I, I think we'll probably get into this in conversation. I mean, a lot happened in the last uh, three or four years in this whole space that kind of slowed things down. So, so it didn't quite play out the way we intended to, but, you know, that's, that's, that's part of, uh, you know, new technology and, and trying to, to move forward in a new direction that happens once in a while, but we're not giving up. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. So the Cadillac CTS vehicles could communicate with each other, but we're only talking a very, uh, about a very small percentage of the vehicle fleet. I think you said, what, 20, 30,000 in that case? Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the big deal or, you know, the big issue with, with making V2X an effective technology is you need to get some critical mass of vehicles. And so somebody has to be first. And so, yeah, we knew that, you know, the, the upward upside potential was going to be limited at the start. And so, um, so yeah, they were initially only able to talk to a relatively small number of other Cadillac CTSs. But uh, again, it was the, the initial run was probably more about learning than it was deployment uh, until we got the flywheel going, so to speak. Understandable, yes. So what are the system capabilities in terms of V2I communication, uh, which would allow the vehicle to expand its capabilities? Yeah, so on, on those, those applications, uh, on the vehicles we deployed did not have V2I uh, capabilities, but um, you know, V2I has always been part of what can make a whole V2X network work, right? And in fact, um, you know, I think you know, as we studied over the years, I think many of us came to realize that the 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 I, the infrastructure type applications, you know, might might even be more valuable than the individual vehicle ones, because um, you know, just like you were alluding to a few minutes ago, Mike, uh, you you might wait a long time to encounter another uh, vehicle that's equipped with the same kind of radio, another Cadillac CTS in this case, um, but if you've got a, a traffic intersection or a or a, you know, part of a highway or something equipped, and, and there's a group of vehicles that pass that every day on their way to work, then that, that can all of a sudden become pretty valuable, right? So, so it's always envisioned it's gonna take both. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it's, even though the, the, the upside of getting all the infrastructure equipped might ultimately be the one that, that drives it, makes the benefit, um, you know, as you probably well know, uh, there, there's a lot of infrastructure um, drivers around a, a country as big as ours. We've got different states and municipalities and uh, different different ways that different highways and roads are are managed and put together with contracts. And so, you know, it it probably was going to be a little bit easier for NHTSA, who has regulatory authority over all new vehicles in the U.S., 
to kind of be the driver on the vehicle side of it. And so we would all put these common radios into our vehicles was the thought. And then uh, the infrastructure part would have to be coordinated a little bit more. And, you know, some pockets may happen sooner and some maybe we're going to take a little longer. And that, But that was kind of the, the big picture of how are we going to get the, the U.S. To, to have this capability. You talked about the V2B features of the Cadillac CTS. As a safety board, we are always concerned with crash prevention. Can you discuss how Cadillac CTS can provide imminent crash prevention capability? No, so so those those vehicles that we that we did in that 2017 2019 timeframe, they just had those three features. Um, so those are kind of you know early ones. Some of us refer to those kind of features as you know day one features. Um, you know those are kind of the the walk before you run features. But you know the the industry had you know as well as you know DOT and others have done work for years on um, you know what comes after day one, right? The more complicated features and, you know, ideally the ones you're referring to where we could actually do, you know, true active safety intervention type features. Um, you know, initially, yeah, we, we, we viewed it as, you know, they would be warning type features where you're enhancing and helping a driver with information, kind of like the first generation of our active safety features where we did collision warning. And then, uh, and then as, our, as our sensing capability and our algorithms got better, you know, we evolved it very quickly to do actually emergency braking, right? So collision warning turned into emergency braking. And, and we kind of envisioned the same thing here that, you know, initial applications, initial trials would be more warning-based features. And then as we as we get get more sensors out there and perfect the technology, we could move into to intervention type features. And there's also work looking at um, how we could even merge, you know, some of the onboard vehicle features like like the sensors that we use to do uh, collision warning and auto emergency braking with um, connected vehicle technology with, with, with V2V, right? So then we could actually have some redundancy of sensing. And so we'd have the, the V2V sensing uh, as well as an onboard sensing and you can confirm them. And, and if you have that, you know, now you can make even more of these, you know, crash imminent type uh, decisions because you need more confidence. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, as you're aware, earlier this year, the FCC finalized the ruling that shrunk the spectrum by 60%. At this time, the agency also proposed rulemaking to allocate the remaining 30 megahertz spectrum for use of only LTE V2X devices and ceasing the use of DSRC. I'd like to hear your thoughts about the impact of these FCC decisions. And let's start with discussing the immediate impact on the DSRC equipped Cadillac CTS, would these ve vehicles be able to continue broadcasting? Um, our, our understanding is no. Um, so, um, you know, we, we're anticipating, um, you know, we've talked about it. We have we have some some plans that have been finalized. You know how we will you know effectively decommission those those vehicles because the the rule change that the FCC you know did would, would basically take that channel that we're currently using that's currently was was only allowed to be used by DSRC and now they've changed that and so um, you know uh, radios operating in that part of the spectrum right now with DSRC will need to be to be changed and so um, yeah we, we've got plans in place and you know we'll have to through through software updates to those vehicles essentially um, turn that feature back off uh, because it will no longer be legal <laughs> the way that they change the uh, the spectrum so um, yeah there, there's a few things about the the recent uh, uh, changes that the FCC is taking that that we're not happy about <laughs> um, and, and would you like me to Get, get into that some? Well, we, we can talk about it right now. I think my follow-on question here may, may get into that. We had an uh, early episode of talk with uh, Bob Kreeb from NHTSA, who discussed the agency's research on the impact of interference on V2X communication with the 30 megahertz spectrum. We came to question the basic viability of V2X from that discussion. Can you talk about the overall impact of the FCC's decision to shrink the dedicated spectrum and the implications of the proposed rulemaking 
that specifies a particular technology that should be used? Yeah, so, so you know, we, we as an industry have, uh, you know, I've tried to work to preserve the 75 megahertz that are in the 5.9 spectrum. I mean, I, I would say that the, the single biggest issue we had was, was the need to maintain enough spectrum to be able to do all the ITS and safety applications that we all, you know, really dreamed about doing to, to realize all the, all the benefits, especially the safety benefits. And um, so, so the number one thing I, I'd say that, that has been troublesome is just is shrinking that down to 30 and, and you know, giving away, moving away that 45 megahertz for unlicensed usage. Um, so now instead of having 75, you know, we're now down to, to 30 to be able to do all these, these applications that we all envision doing. And then, uh, and then I would say our, our second main concern has been that even with, with that smaller space of the spectrum that's now gonna be available for these applications, there's a lot of concern about um, interference. And I think that's what uh, Bob Creed was getting at. Um, interference from, from the unlicensed users on either sides of that band and um, the concerns that they could interfere with, with the, the safety transmissions that we may be doing within that. So, you know, you asked a little bit ago about, you know, actual, you know, crash avoidance and crash imminent type applications. Well, you know, if we're going to be sending signals between vehicles that could ultimately involve controls and, you know, applying brakes and, you know, taking uh, active steps to avoid crashes, um, uh, we, you need to have a lot of confidence that that signal is going to be protected and that it's accurate um, and it's secure. And uh, there's been a fair amount of work done about this, these interference questions. Um, we, uh, we as an industry, a lot of the work we've done over the years, by the way, has been through a, a consortium um, known as CAMP, Crash Avoidance Metric Partnerships. And um, over the years, we've had most OEMs at one point or another involved in um, consortium projects, um, along with, with GM and Ford and Toyota, um, Honda, uh, several, uh, Hyundai, several of our, uh, you know, big, big uh, OEMs working together on, on you know, ways, ways to do V2X technology. And um, some of the studies we've worked on together have looked at this interference question, where we actually built up a bunch of um, uh, radios, whether they're DSRC radios, whether they're CV2X radios, and have tested them for, for interference. And, you know, the concerns are real. Uh, we, we supplied the, um, a lot of data to the, uh, to the FCC in different phases of the rulemaking. Um, you know, and so has NHTSA. You know, NHTSA has been involved with, with a lot of these studies, and they share the same same concerns. Um, so, so we've been pretty um, pretty adamant throughout this this rulemaking with FCC that that we and I'll say you know most of our industry brethren have have been of the of a, of a like mind. You know, there, there's there's differences like there always are of opinions in, in certain aspects, but in general, I think the industry has been pretty solid that we need to keep. Uh, as much of the spectrum as possible. Ideally, keep the 75 that's been allocated for the last 20 years or so, um, and protect it from uh, from interference. Now, you know the other the other issue has been, you know, which technology um, are we going to use uh, to communicate within the spectrum? And you now there's been a fair amount of debate um, within the uh, the technical community and within the. The, the supply base and the chip makers and the OEMs about which one. And I would say our, our position at the end of the day is that it really doesn't matter. Uh, we, we're okay with, I mean, we, we did this initial deployment like we talked in uh, 2017 with, with DSRC radios because that was the only technology that, that had been studied in, in recent years. It was proven, um, including through the, the 3000 vehicle pilot study that NHTSA did. It was the subject of the rulemaking that NHTSA was moving forward with. So all the stars were suggesting to us that it's going to be DSRC, and that's what the supply base and everybody else was working on. Um, over these last few years, while there's been a lot more um, debate about, about the spectrum and the unlicensed use, and there was a change of administration that uh, had a little different view on, on rulemaking, um, it kind of allowed uh, 
others to bring forward other technologies. And, and so one of them was the, uh, the more cellular based um, CV2X and uh, a lot of work has been done on that one. Quite honestly, it's not quite yet evolved to the same point that DSRC was or is in terms of readiness to deploy. Um, however, you know, our view is that there's no reason why it can't be. And so, you know, at the end of the day, if, if the technology to use is, is CB2X, we're good with it. And we, we've said that. We said that in our comments to the FCC. We've said it to, um, to, to NHTSA, to the public elsewhere. Um, the, the, the debate between CB2X versus DSRC, you know, I think has become a bit of a distraction on the whole issue. And um, uh, you know, our, our view has kind of been, it's, it's probably best to set that aside. And you know, it's more important that we all agree on using one technology um, than it is whether it's A or B at the end of the day. And so that's been our view on, on that. So, so really the two rubs uh, with the FCC rulemaking is that you know, they, they shrunk it down to the point where um, even, even future versions of CB2X technology won't fit within the, the shrunken spectrum. And so that limits what we can do. And then the interference piece. So it's the size and the interference piece that we really think are problematic. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, for that uh, answer. And that's a, that's a good in lead into my next question here is, considering that you introduced a production vehicle with V2X capabilities in 2017, I'm interested in your views on the lack of progress that we as a nation have made in deploying this life-saving life technology. As you know, the NTSB recommend, recommended that NHTSA mandate connected vehicle technology in 2013. In our conversations with different vehicle manufacturers over the last year, we heard a certain level of support for such mandate, primarily because of the current uncertainty about the safety spectrum and the lack of DOT direction regarding the communication protocol technology that should be used. What is your view regarding the necessity for a government mandate for V2X? Or I guess a better way of me asking this question is, do you believe that the regulatory uncertainty is the primary reason for our stalled deployment of V2X technology? So, yeah, I, I would say that uncertainty is easily the, the primary reason that we haven't gotten very far. Um, you know, there, there was a lot of commitment. I mean, we, we did this deployment first that we talked about, but there was quite a bit of momentum with some of the other OEMs um, as well. I mean, after, after we did our, our deployment, you know, Toyota had made an announcement that they were going to deploy on a, on a bunch of vehicles as well. And um, we, had, we had worked a couple of times as an industry to put together uh, some like a voluntary rollout plan. Um, there was a lot of interest in that. So, I mean, I, I truly believe that the the uh, at least a, a, a good amount of the, the momentum of the OEMs um, were willing to to go ahead and deploy, um, given the huge potential for safety benefit. Um, but but you got to have some certainty, right? You got you got to know this is a long term play. We can't deploy it for five years and then we decide we're going to change horses. Um, you can't have just some of the brands deploying and not the others. We you kind of need to be all in. It doesn't need to be one hundred percent all in. But you need to have some some critical mass. So so to that extent, or for the, you know, really for that reason, we were supportive of NHTSA moving forward with with a mandate. Um, you know, we're we're often uh, we're often not supportive as a, as an OEM industry of of mandates. Um, you know, we, we like anybody else, we kind of like to develop things your own way and apply it your own way and, and, and deal with our customers our own way. And so sometimes we're very skeptical of, of, of government mandates per se. Um, uh, but, but this was one of those cases and there've been others, but this is one of those cases where we, we were very supportive. So, you know, when the, when the NPRM came out uh, from NHTSA to create a brand new FMVSS 150, I, th I think it was in the end of 2016, I think in that, in that time frame. Um, we, we submitted very extensive comments, included, you know, data that we had collected, included a lot of the data from this, this camp consortium uh, projects that we'd worked on over the years. And, uh, and, and in those comments, you know, we were, we were very supportive and encouraging of moving forward with, with the mandate. Because really, we saw that as the only way to get enough certainty that uh, everybody would design their radios to be interoperable 
and, and to the same message sent, et cetera, et cetera. And at the time, uh, you know, the, the spectrum rules from the FCC had already been in place for over 10 years. And, you know, we saw that as certainty as well, right? It was, it was 75 megahertz and you had to use this DSRC technology. So the only other piece we needed was the mandate to put it on the vehicles uh, in, in the same way. And NHTSA was going to do that. And uh, so that, that, was, that was certainty. Well, the, you know, the rulemaking got stalled. And then the, the FCC you know, began listening to other, other interests. And we get that. It's, it's valuable spectrum. Um, other interests for using it for unlicensed uses. And, uh, you know, those two things together kind of kind of created a perfect storm of uncertainty. And, uh, and, and now we have, you know, very little, <laughs> really, we, well, we, we have no certainty at this moment uh, about the ability to deploy. And, you know, it, it, it not only, you know, puts the ability to realize the benefits of the, this huge, you know, safety problem of, of crashes, it, it puts that at risk of being ever able to achieve it, but also puts us, you know, potentially way behind other countries around the world um, who are moving ahead with with connected vehicle technologies. I mean, it's been, you know, developed uh, for the same period of time in Europe, and, and there are people moving ahead in, in Europe. Of course, Japan's been using uh, these, these technologies already for some years with a lot of V2V and V2I applications. And, uh, you know, China's the one that's you know, really, you know, moving very quickly um, to, to mandate uh CV2X technology, you know, we, we sell vehicles, a lot of vehicles we sell in, in China, General Motors does. And, uh, you know, so we're developing, uh, you know, the CV2X uh, applications on, on our vehicles in China um, as well. And, uh, you know, we're really concerned that, you know, have we missed that window, you know, here in the U.S. to, to take advantage of this technology because of the squabbles between uh, different, you know, different interests and different uses of the, of the spectrum. And, uh so, you know, we hope not. That's why we really appreciate the NTSB is still taking an interest here and you know, giving us a platform to talk about it. Um, you know, we've continued to talk with, with DOT and, and others. Uh, we're, we're also still talking to the, to the FCC when we, when we get a chance and say, hey, you know, this, this is still a huge safety opportunity. Um, can't we find a way to preserve enough width of spectrum to do this? And, um, you know, and then, and then I, if so, I think we as an industry can still work together and agree on, you know, all right, which technology we're going to use, A or B or C, and, and set up the rule structure so that we can see some certainty. And then we can get back to maybe, uh, um, you know, developing some, some industry-wide rollouts. Great. Thank you for that. So the FCC has shrunk the safety spectrum, but the NTSB remains committed to the safety promise of this technology whether by reversing the decision or employing other means of ensuring sufficient number of channels that are free of interference. With an assumption, an assumption of a viable safety spectrum, what do you think would be the best way forward for broad deployment of V2X? So obviously a mandate is one of the options. Others may be industry consensus or one or two big vehicle manufacturers deploying technology in its entire fleet or perhaps uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, the path that the industry and NHTSA took regarding AEB. Yeah, so I think, Mike, any of the above uh, could work. Maybe it's all of the above. Um, but I I'm telling you, none of the above are, are going to happen if we, if we don't have enough certainty that that space is available. So the the, the shrinking from the 75 to 30, you know, really, really does shrink or limit, um, you know, how far we can even go with, with V2V technology. So, you know, for example, you know, the, the FCC rule, you know, will, will, uh, will favor or will mandate uh, CV2X technology. And like I said, you know, we're fine with that, with, with either technology, if that, if that's how that comes out, but um, you know, there's, there's two generations of CV2X technology that are already envisioned. The first one is more of an LTE based um, CV2X technology, and it uses 20 megahertz. And it can do a lot of initial applications. Um, you know, we, we, we can put 
those radios on our vehicles and we can use CVX technology inside that 20. Um, but, but the applications will be fairly limited because of the, uh, the interference concerns on, on this fair, fairly narrow band that we have now. Um, and because the, 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 the technology itself inside that, that 20 megahertz is, you know, it is limited. It's not, it's not the next generation of, of what Qualcomm and others have developed. So the next generation of CV to tech, CV to X technology, which is, you know, more of a 5G based um, cellular system, um, it actually needs 40 megahertz additional. They, they don't operate in the same band. So it needs a 40 additional to realize it. So if we've shrunk from 75 to 30, there ain't no 40 anymore. And so, you know, I think some have talked about, all right, well, maybe we'll go find that, that other 40 somewhere else in the spectrum so that we can get there someday. But, you know, I think you can see my point that we, we've now gone from having certainty of 75 hertz, megahertz to uh, certainty of not having enough. And now we got to go find, you know, spectrum somewhere else. And, you know, again, it's very valuable. So, I mean, the chances of that happening now just have become much, much less. And so, you know, if, if, if the industry as a whole, and I include, you know, DOTs and others in that from a safety standpoint, can't see that we are going to be able to realize, you know, the next generation of the communication technology so that we really can do, you know, you know, automation features and, and some of the, you know, crash imminent features, like you mentioned, um, that's going to stifle, uh, you know, the ability for, for the industry to agree to, to go ahead and deploy. So you might see some initial deployments here, but, you know, we, we all look ahead with a long-term vision. And, and if we're going to run out of steam, so to speak, because of this, because the spectrum is limited in five or 10 years, you know, that's, that's going to limit how much deployment that, that you actually see. Um, if we could at least have the amount of spectrum still made available, um, I think we could go back to, you know, your, your list of, of which option. I mean, a, a industry commitment of some sort of an MOU, absolutely, we'd be interested in that. We, we had quite a bit of momentum going on that a few years ago until the uncertainty said, well, now we can't even agree on doing that because we're not certain that it's going to be there. Um uh, a mandate from NHTSA on the radios, I think, could still be on the table. I think, you know, we'd be open to it. Again, uh, we, we all realize that we're all going to have to use the same radio technology anyway um, in order for it to work. So might as well put that in a rule and, and have that, you know, across the board. Um, so, yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll, or could it be a couple of couple few larger OEMs that try to get the flywheel going? Sure, that can happen too. You know, we tried to be that one. In, uh, in the 2017 CTSs and, uh, you know, the, the flywheel couldn't get going the way we wanted to, but, you know, sure, that, that, could, that could be an approach again too. But without the 75, it, it's, it's kind of hard to convince everybody that, that, that it's going to be real. And I, so I'd say, you know, that, that's probably the number one issue is, is the, the lack of, of, of the 75 now. And now we just got this 30 and you know, we're going to go shopping for the rest of it down the road, it just makes people feel uncertain. You said earlier regarding different options for deployment of V2X that none of the above will happen if we don't make the spectrum available. That tells us a lot. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, you know, I think we've covered most of it. You know, I guess my, my message would be, and I know you've talked to others in the, uh, others in the industry here in some of these sessions, and hopefully you're hearing the same kind of kind of input that we're, we're, we're still willing to work together, you know, in, in the safety area. Um, well, you know, we're, we're fierce competitors, first of all, the other OEMs and us, and we, you know, we, we will fight and over, over price and how great our features are. And we think our styling's better and we got there first and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in the safety area, we we've always, worked a lot together and, and trying to find common ground and developing standards and um, common technologies. And I tell you on this, this whole uh, V to X space, um, you know, I, I forget the number we came up with that we um, you know, had supplied in our comments to NHTSA a few years back though, um, how many tens of millions of dollars the industry had worked on together and collaborative projects with government funding as well to, uh, to work on this and, and you know, everybody wants it to work. Everybody knows that, you know, there's no other technology that's going to benefit 80% of, 
of, of crashes or at least non-impaired crashes. Um, so why not work on it together? And so I think, I think again, hopefully you'll find from the comments from others that the, uh, uh, the interest and the desire is still there um, to realize the safety benefits. It only makes transportation uh, better for all of us if we can you know, help, help with you know, flowing of vehicle, traffic jams, um, you know, helps with the environment, uh, is, you know, all those things in addition to safety. Um, there's no reason to not work together, but you know, we, we need to have the support of, uh, you know, in this case, the FCC to, um, to be able to use that, that spectrum that was actually promised to the uh, transportation industry um, originally. So we, we need ideally to get back to that. And then I think you'd find that the industry would be happy to work together and, and try to realize the benefits. Thank you for that, John. I appreciate you being with us today and providing us with some great insight and firsthand experience with connected vehicle technologies. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Mike. We really appreciate the chance to be part of this. Thank you to the NTSB for keeping it going. Dr. John Kinney is a Director of Networking Research and a senior principal researcher at Toyota Infotech Labs in Mountain View, California. His team develops vehicular, communications, and cybersecurity technologies for connected mobility. John's research focuses on channel congestion control, V2X performance, and spectrum sharing. He represents Toyota in international standards organizations and industry research consortia, including SAE, IEEE, ETSI, and the Car to Car Communications Consortium. John has graduate degrees from Stanford and Notre Dame. John, welcome and thank you for being with us today. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting Toyota to participate. It's our pleasure. Well, let's just jump into this. Uh, earlier in this episode, I talked with a guest from GM who is still the only manufacturer in the U.S. that has equipped a production vehicle with V2X technology. But in April of 2018, Toyota announced plans to start equipping the portion of its fleet with V2X technology. Before we discuss the events that occurred after that announcement, can you talk about why Toyota made these initial plans and the research that you have done in this area? Sure. Um, so a little bit of background first. I, I, one thing I want to say at the outset is that Toyota has a long, a long term, long stated commitment toward zero fatalities from traffic crashes on the road. And uh, we're looking at a wide range of technologies to help us realize that goal. Some of them we can do by ourselves, like automated, automated emergency braking systems or other advanced driver assistance systems that operate based on uh, information that the vehicle has and that our own sensors can provide to us. But we viewed V2X, we have viewed V2X as an important complement to those uh, to those onboard systems. Uh, V2X is a, is a cooperative system where we gather additional information from other vehicles and other sources. And, and that can help us see things, uh, for example, around a corner uh, to prevent a, a, an intersection collision that maybe uh, onboard systems aren't as able to do. So we've always viewed V2X as an important complement to help us reach that zero fatality goal. Uh, we've participated in development of V2X technologies for uh, more than 15 years, uh, since before I even joined Toyota. And we, uh, in the early days and in, in uh, a large portion of that period, we were doing joint research, pre-competitive research with other automakers to help realize uh, this, the, develop the technology, improve its feasibility, and, uh, and, uh, and show that it indeed could be used to, to save lives and to improve traffic efficiency. So leading up to the 2018, uh, 2018 announcement, uh, what we had seen was strong momentum, uh, both among industry partners and with the um, US Department of Transportation uh, to move us in, uh, toward a, a deployment of vehicle to vehicle communication systems for safety. Um, but there was some evidence that, uh, that, that, the, that that momentum was slowing down a little bit. Uh, the, the, the NHTSA B2V rulemaking proposal had been delayed and there was a new administration and there was some, some question about whether they would be able to follow through on that. So we decided that as, as one of the leaders in the industry, we would 
step forward and, and announce our intention to deploy that technology. And we encouraged other automakers in the same breath to join us and make public statements about their intentions. Um, so we believed that that would help uh, that would help bring the industry together, not just in agreement about how to do it, but actually doing it. Excellent. So exactly a year after that announcement, Toyota announced the suspension of its V2X deployment plans. And I've read the letter that you submitted to the FCC docket in which you discuss this. Can you expand on the reasons for Toyota's decision to suspend deployment? Yeah, that was a that was a difficult decision, and and it was a reflection of some changed circumstances in the one year uh, after our 2018 announcement. Um, essentially, some things had happened, and some things hadn't happened, and and uh, that we were hoping would happen, and and uh, that led us to the conclusion that it was probably not in our customers' best interest to proceed along the original timeline. But we reiterated our strong support for the concept of V2X, and that we have continued to evaluate and, and, and hope that we get to a point where deployment will, uh, will, will be feasible and, and will make sense. So what, what changed? Um, we cited two main uh, reasons in our, in our 2019 announcement. One was uh, a lack of, of new commitments from other automakers to deploy, which we had called for. Um, and the other was the, the, that the regulatory environment, which already had some uncertainty in it, had become increasingly uncertain in the one year uh, period. And perhaps emblematic of that, the best uh, symbol of that was uh, a letter that Toyota was sent from the FCC uh, shortly after our 2018 announcement. So we had been, um, we had been advised, look, uh, all of you in the auto industry, if you don't deploy and use the spectrum, we, it might be taken away from you. And what we learned from that letter was essentially, even if you do deploy, we'll probably take it away from you anyway. Uh, so that was a, you know, that was a kind of a intended to be a chilled, chilling message. And, and a lot of the people, not just in Toyota, but across the industry uh, who saw that viewed it as such. Uh, so that was, that was one of the elements of, of increased regulatory uncertainty that led us to believe this is probably not in our, our customers' best interest right now. Let's remember that it's, it's always been the case that with this cooperative technology, in order to get widespread benefits, we have to have widespread deployment, not just from one or two automakers, but really uh, across the industry as much as possible. And so that's why we were always encouraging and working with other automakers to bring this to fruition. Um, but uh, when we see that kind of chilling effect, uh, even to the point of, of undermining investments that have been made, um, it's, it's hard to proceed. Understandably, thank you for sharing that. Well, your fears were realized this year. In our first episode, we talked to Bob Creed from NHTSA, who discussed the agency's research on the impact of the FCC's decision to shrink the safety spectrum to only 30 megahertz. Based on that discussion, we here came to question the basic viability of V2X. Can you talk about the impact of the FCC's decision to shrink the spectrum? And can you also address the FCC's proposed rulemaking that specifies the technology that should be used for communication, or rather, which one cannot be used? Yeah, so th let's talk about the FCC's uh, first report in order. Um, there really are three important pillars to that. And, and from our perspective, all of those have a negative effect on, on encouraging widespread deployment. The first was the reduction of, this, of the spectrum by 60% from 75 to 30 megahertz. Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about what maybe we can still do and what we can't do in that remaining 30 megahertz. But it's obvious on, on the face of it that um, when you lose 60% of your, of your spectrum, then, then it, you're gonna lose the ability to do a lot of things that, that you need to do. The second was that the interference rules that they set up for the adjacent unlicensed uh, uh, devices like Wi-Fi devices, which are on both sides of our band, um, were very, uh, very liberal or, or loose. Uh, and and, and it's, it's not at all clear that with those interference rules, we would be protected from harmful interference as we need to be if we're going to use this remaining spectrum for uh, safety services, if we're going to use it to prevent collisions, for example. So even the 30 megahertz, whether we can use it is, is in, in doubt. 
And then the third pillar of that was this uh, decision to, to move away from the technology that had been proven and about which there had been a strong degree of consensus to a new technology that in our view is still not, is still not sufficiently proven um, and about which there's clearly not a consensus. So for example, when we commented uh, to the FCC on this, on this uh, rulemaking and, and their proposal for a second rulemaking, um, with regard to the technology question, we said, um, look, it's, it's not the FCC's job to pick winners and losers of technology here. That's really up to uh, the industry to form a consensus in partnership with, with the transportation uh, experts in the US DOT. That's what happened originally when DSRC was put into the rules. The industry came together and then together we went to the FCC and said, please, please endorse this. What's happened now is that there's clearly a, a lack of industry consensus about how to move forward with technology. There's at least three families of technologies that uh, are on the table. There's the, there's the DSRC and next generation DSRC family. There's this LTE V2X, this older version of cellular V2X, and there's a newer version of cellular V2X called 5G new radio that's already been standardized and is sort of poised to uh, to take over some of that responsibility from LTE V2X. So uh, looking at that landscape of choices and looking at how industry actors are, are reacting to that, we don't see a kind of consensus that we think that would need to be there for the FCC to then endorse one of those as the only way to move forward. Instead, we advise the FCC to, to defer their decision about endorsing a technology until an industry consensus can be shown to have re-emerged. Uh, so all three of those really are, are negative with respect to providing a catalyst or an impetus toward uh, moving ahead for widespread deployment in our opinion. Excellent, thank you for that. I would like to hear your opinion about the capabilities within the current limited spectrum of only 30 megahertz, while making a very large assumption that those channels would be clear of interference. What would be possible within that spectrum? And just as importantly, what would not be possible? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and we'll get a little bit technical here, but um, one, one thing to realize is that not all V2X applications have equal bandwidth requirements. Some require a lot, some require a, a more modest amount. One of them re that requires a lot of bandwidth is the, the dissemination of the basic safety message. This is the, the message that all vehicles send uh, frequently to update all of their neighbors about what they're doing and where they're going. And that's really the core message that allows us to, uh, to prevent collisions. Uh, so because every, every vehicle is sending them frequently, you get a lot of basic safety messages in a channel. And with the remaining spectrum, we can expect that to be dominated by basic safety messages. Uh, so the good news is that if we could get through, if we could get past the interference concern, which you mentioned in your, in your, in your question, let, let's for a moment concede that, the, the, that it could be protected from harmful interference. If we could get to that point, we could still disseminate basic safety messages. What else could we do? Well, then we have to turn to the applications that don't have such high bandwidth requirements. And there are some important ones. Typically, these are infrastructure to vehicle communication messages because since there are relatively few roadside units sending them, they don't add up to that much uh, of a channel load. So this would be things like intersection state, uh, timing state of signals that can be used to prevent collisions and also to improve traffic flow. There are messages that can help with transit signal priority and emergency vehicle uh, signal preemption. There are messages that can alert a vehicle to road safety issues. There are messages that can help with um, correcting for position inaccuracy. Uh, so, uh, so a handful of those would probably also be supportable. So what, what's left out of that equation? Well, a lot, unfortunately. Um, uh, one area that, that we think is quite important that probably there's not enough spectrum for is protecting pedestrians and other vulnerable road users through the dissemination of their status so that vehicles know where they are. Um, again, that can be a high bandwidth consuming application and it really needs additional spectrum. Another broad area that needs more spectrum is uh, what we call cooperation for automated driving or cooperative automated driving. Uh, this is a, a set of applications that includes things like cooperative perception where a, a, a vehicle can share information about the objects it, it has detected, 
uh, cooperative localization, cooperative positioning, cooperative mapping, cooperative maneuvering, where, for example, as, as vehicles are merging onto a, onto a road, they can communicate with each other to make sure that that's done safely. It also includes uh, actions like platooning, which can be important for um, really all of us, but especially for the commercial sector. Um, there's probably not spectrum in the 30 megahertz for any of those uh, class of applications. Thanks for sharing that. I'm interested in your views on the lack of progress that we as a nation have made in deploying this life-saving technology. In 2013, the NTSB recommended that NHTSA mandate connected vehicle technology, which is why we were very supportive of NHTSA's proposed rulemaking in January of 2017 to do just that. And nearly five years later, we seem to be reg regressing. In our conversations with different vehicle manufacturers over the last year, we heard a certain level of support for a mandate, primarily because of the uncertainty about the safety spectrum and the lack of DOT direction regarding the communication protocol. I'm interested in your views on how we as a nation can reverse our current path and move toward widespread V2X deployment. Mandate is certainly one option, but others may include industry consensus or one or two big vehicle manufacturers deploying the technology in their entire fleet, or perhaps a memorandum of understanding uh, the path that the industry and NHTSA took regarding the AAB. What do you think would be the best way forward for broad deployment of V2X? Yeah, that, that's a great question, because ultimately that's really what we need. We need to solve that problem. Uh, we can't afford to let this languish. So um, we, we were strong supporters of the V2V um, NPRM that came out of NHTSA in 2017 that you mentioned, as were most uh, automakers and most infrastructure owner operators. Uh, so, so there was there was a good level of support for for that kind of regulation, which can be a little bit unusual. Often, the the subjects of regulation are not so uh, enthused about it, but in this case, we're we're supporting it not just because we want them to tell us to do it, but we want them to tell everybody to do it. Again, that's where the benefit comes from. When we get widespread deployment, our customers take uh, get the benefit of, of our vehicle being able to communicate with vehicles from all manufacturers, not just other Toyota vehicles. Um, so that mandate model is, is and should still be uh, on the table. Um, and it, and in the end, it might it, it might be the best way forward if we can if we can come around to it. The other models that you mentioned that they are more on the voluntary side of things, whether it's a leader or two leaders taking uh, taking getting out in front or uh, mutual uh, understanding. Um, you know those are those could be viable as well. But I, I want to step back from that and say I think as an industry we have to solve. A more fundamental problem first before we really can hope to to get there, and that is the lack of agreement, the lack of consensus about what kind of technology to use as a building block. Um, you know, it, it, this this may be obvious to everyone, but um, for for cooperative technology like V2X, it doesn't work if every if we don't have everybody singing from the same hymnal, so to speak, or uh, I've used the, the example of different languages. You know, if, if everybody agrees to communicate like we are here today in English, then we can have a, a good level of communication. But if a faction decides, no, we prefer a different language like Klingon or something, you know, that's not going to work. Um, we're not going to be able to communicate across our groups. That's kind of where we are right now. Um, we had a consensus around DSRC. That consensus is no longer there. Um, we need to build a new consensus. And that's what I was saying earlier. I don't see that we're at that point yet. So um, I don't know that it's realistic to have regulators pick pick a winner uh, so much as we really need to come together as industry, as key industry stakeholders and say, let's, let's work this out. Let's work out our problem here. Um, is it going to be DSRC and the next generation DSRC? Is it going to be LTE V2X? Is it going to be the newer generation of cellular uh, V2X, the 5G new radio form? Is it going to be something else? You know, I know a lot of people say we just need to agree on something and move forward, and and I and I think that sentiment is 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 accurate. But the agreeing is a challenge, and and it's going to take some work. And and probably there's a role for USDOT and, and organizations like NTSB to help facilitate that building of consensus. Um, so far, we're not showing a great ability to do it on our own, so we could probably use some help. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. 
I have to switch just a little bit. Can you briefly talk about Toyota's V2X efforts in Japan? My understanding is that a portion of Toyota fleet has V2X capabilities there. Yeah, that's right. And we're, we're very proud of that. We've been deploying um, a DSRC-based system in, in Japan since 2015. Um, the, in Japan, this is called the ITS Connect system. So if, you're, if your listeners are interested, they can Google Japan ITS Connect and you'll see a lot of information about this system. Um, this is available on a, a large, uh, large number of Toyota models in Japan these days. And I think the, the, the vehicle count is, is well over 200,000, approaching quarter of a million vehicles at this point that are, have this technology deployed, as well as uh, over 100 intersections that are equipped not just with roadside units to communicate, but with sensors that can detect the presence of pedestrians, that can detect the presence of oncoming vehicles that maybe are not in the line of sight of the driver. Um, so these systems will help, with, again, as we've been saying, it'll help with safety, it'll help with traffic efficiency, um, and, and we're proud of that, and, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, continued growth in that. Great. Thank you for that. I, I know I've asked you a lot of questions here, and we're kind of coming to the end of the uh, discussion. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to this? Um, I think I just would want to 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 end with by saying, you know, there there have been some reasons for pessimism recently, um, but we have to be optimistic about the future of V2X. It's too important to let it uh, to let it languish. It's too important to to let it fail. We have to find ways uh, forward to achieve widespread deployment. And I really am optimistic that we're going to we're going to work that out. We're going to do it. It's going to be hard. We're, it's going to take some good faith discussions and, and consensus building, um, but it's, it's just too important to, uh, to, to not achieve that. So I'm looking forward to continuing to work with my partners, my colleagues at other automakers and in the infrastructure community to making this happen. Great. I agree with you. Um, I, I really appreciate you being with us today and taking the time out of your busy schedule. And uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on this important safety technology. Well, I appreciate the invitation and we really appreciate NTSB's leadership in this area as well, including with this series of videos. So thank you very much. You're welcome. V2X technology can save lives and is ready to save lives today. The two vehicle manufacturers that I talked to today expressed their strong support for this technology and described their research that allowed them to move toward V2X deployment. While these two manufacturers also expressed a division within the industry regarding the communication protocol to be used for V2X, the industry is uniform regarding the most important aspect, that the FCC's decision to shrink the safety spectrum to only 30 megahertz represents a dire detriment to the deployment of V2X technology. We also heard another consistent message today. Regulatory uncertainty is one of the primary reasons for the continued lack of V2X deployment. This regulatory uncertainty is caused by the FCC's recent actions and the lack of DOT leadership. This series is part of our Most Wanted List advocacy for the deployment of connected vehicle technology in all highway vehicles.